All right, it is time now for one of my favorite parts of the Combine, getting to sit down with the legendary oh, Greg boy. Cosell oh, from boy. NFL Films. Greg, how are you doing? Uh, well, after that introduction, I don't know. How am I doing? <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, I, guess this is, this I, guess you'll the, I guess you'll be the judge of that after I'm done talking. <laughs> we literally have people who have called the show, who tweet the show, who have said, when will you guys have the Cosell interview? There's a guy, no kidding, tweeted me this morning, said, I need to know when you're airing it so I can build my day around it. So wow. This is, this is the kind of cachet think, you have I in think Cleveland. that guy needs a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I hear golf is a wonderful hobby out there. All right, Greg, let's talk about, as we always do, and for the Browns it seems this question remains eternal or ongoing, omnipresent, the quarterbacks. And I know nobody watches film like you do on these quarterbacks and one of the very most respected voices in terms of film study on the position. So let's get into it. But first, I know from talking to you yesterday, maybe a little bit of a slight change in your process to keep it interesting to you. Yeah, I mean, every year I try to figure out how I want to watch quarterbacks because, you know, being fortunate to be able to see the coaching tape, obviously I watch full games and every drop back. But this year I tried to do it a little more situationally as well. Like I looked at all third downs because obviously that's a big down in the NFL. I also took a look at all 15-plus yard plays by, by these top five, six quarterbacks because I wanted to see how they made their good plays, uh, particularly in an era where it seems more and more quarterbacks, Nathan, are, are so-called second reaction outside of structure players. And I wanted to get a feel for how – you know, if quarterbacks are making a lot of plays that way, because smart, reasonable people will disagree on the relative value of that in evaluating quarterbacks. There are some guys who believe that, hey, if my quarterback can't function efficiently in the pocket, no matter what he can do outside with second reaction plays, then it's going to be really hard for him to be consistent week to week because I'm building a game plan and I'm building a game plan for a reason. Absolutely. So, and then there's other people I talk to, as I said, really smart, reasonable people, decision makers in the league, who will say, the first thing they'll say to me about a guy is, oh, we love him because of his ability to get out of the pocket and run around and make plays. So now it becomes a philosophy because smart people disagree on this. And that's why it's so hard. People say to me, well, give me your top five. It, it's, it's hard for me to say that because people have different worldviews of what they want in the quarterback position. Absolutely, and that's a big change. I think yeah. one thing I would say is over time, if you want to be successful in the NFL for a decade, have a run, right. you need to be able to win from the pocket. Would you agree with that? Yes. Consistently. Yes, I, I definitely would agree with that. And this is where I think a number of other factors, though, do come into play. And I'm a big believer in coaching, so that always, to me, comes into play. But then it also comes down to the nature of a team. I think if you're a quarterback on a team, and, and this may not be the Brown situation, we're just talking a little more generally now, but I think that if, if you're um, – on a team that, let's say, has great defense and a big-time runner who you want to give the ball to 20 times a game, then what you ask your quarterback to do might be a little different than if you're on a team where you feel that you have to put up you know, 27 points sure. every week in order to compete. So I think there's so many variables, and I'm just giving you one there. There's, there's many others. But I think there's so, there's so many factors that go in to a specific team drafting a quarterback and how they see a quarterback. The other thing is... Coaches have systems because coaches coach what they know. That's right. You know, I was actually taught that at a very early age by someone we both know very well who's been a mentor to me, Al Saunders. Yeah. Okay, Al's one of my favorite people. I've known Al for a really long Agreed. time. He's taught me an absolute ton of football because he's been in the NFL, I think, since, what, 78 <laughs> or 79? <laughs> since so, I was born. Yeah, so he's taught me a ton of football, and I owe a great debt of gratitude to him for what he's taught me. And he, I remember him telling me years ago, coaches coach what they know. So when a coach looks at a quarterback and evaluates him, they see him in the context of their, their offense. Yep. So it's not just, oh, he's got a big arm, he can do this, he can do that. It's how can he run my offense? And that's the way coaches see it. So it's, it's adaptability to scheme. But for you, when you watch it, you don't have such I try to think of all those things. Think, right. right. I try to think of all those things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're gonna, let's get into these quarterback prospects. And what I want to ask you first, and we'll start there, is who is the best of these prospects you've evaluated from structure in the pocket? I would say Josh Rosen would probably okay. fit that the best because he's a very refined, nuanced, disciplined player. That's the nature of his game. He's a drop-back quarterback. Now, he has movement ability outside the pocket. He was a tennis player, so it's not as if he's a statue. Um, 
there might be some concern with him that his pocket movement, which is different than running outside the pocket. Sure. Pocket movement is generally, you know, think of a of maybe an area that's smaller than a boxing ring, but like that, a confined space where quarterbacks have to move to avoid while still keeping their focus down the field. Tom Brady, who's obviously not a great athlete the way we think of athletes, is phenomenal at pocket movement. Rosen there's a little bit of a question about that. Some people are concerned that because at this point he doesn't exhibit that trait real well that he might get hit a lot. But as far as being refined, dropping back, hitting that back foot, throwing with a sense of timing, anticipation, feel, those traits normally translate to the NFL. Yeah, and that's why I wonder, in some cases, you read a lot of the write-ups on Josh Rosen, and even from hearing from you, this guy's the best in the pocket, best natural thrower. We've heard that best Very natural thrower. And yet he is not, it doesn't seem anyway, the consensus number one guy coming in and has a lot of questions. And I think there's the personality stuff, which I can't get into because I'm not going to sit down with Josh Rosen and spend, you know, a lot of time with him that way. Um, But I think the point you're making is a great one because this gets into that balance now between second reaction outside of structure versus pocket efficiency and years ago the line there was extreme to pocket efficiency now I think we're in a situation where a lot more people look at second reaction as being I don't want to say more important but more important than it was 10 or 12 years ago yeah like you need to have the ability to extend place yes yes so that's where I, that's my point. It comes down to philosophy now. So Rosen is clearly, to me, the most refined, pocket-efficient quarterback in this draft class. Whether that means people see him as the best prospect in the class, that's a philosophy issue. Exactly, and we'll see, I guess, when right. the names are called. Let's go to the guy who does seem to be regarded by many as the top prospect, Sam Darnold. Now, he's a guy that right. might not be the best pocket guy, might not be the best athlete, but seems to be the best maybe combination of every trait you would want. Yeah, and he's big, which obviously people like. Um, the way I would describe Sam Darnold, and, and I had a chance, and I have my notes here, I actually watched uh, six games last summer from his 2016 season and a number of games from this year plus all third downs and all 15 plus, as I said. And the way I would describe him is he's more of a baller than a technician. Yep. You know, he's not a real disciplined pocket player. Uh, his mechanics, particularly lower body mechanics, need some retooling. Which is what he's supposedly working on and Correct. why he's, he's not throwing. Correct, he's working with Jordan Palmer, who's phenomenal. I know Jordan very well, Carson's brother. And Jordan does a great, great job with quarterbacks, so we'll see where that goes. Because Darnold, at this point, misses too many routine throws with a lack of precise ball placement because he's not really that disciplined with his mechanics. Now, I've I've always believed you can fix lower body. You're not going to change the way guys throw a football. Now, he has an odd delivery, but I wouldn't call it slow. It's it's probably elongated. But still quick. But it's still quick, exactly. It's quick within the way he throws it. Right. So, you know, are there a few passes here and there where it really looks bad? Yes, but I wouldn't say his delivery is slow by any means. But he's clearly a guy that can make plays outside of structure. But I think there's a little bit of a reckless nature to his game at this point. So now you get into coaching because everybody's different. I'm not a believer in playing to improvisation. In other words, I think with a guy like Darnold, you have to coach him hard to be disciplined, nuanced, efficient. And then the other stuff becomes the parachute. Not, oh wow, he can make plays. Let's let him run around and make plays. Right. I think you have to start with the structure and let the other stuff be the parachute. Yeah, and I think that's what led to some of the turnovers this yep. year. Certainly trying to throw the ball into places maybe he shouldn't try to make too many plays for a USC team that might have been more depleted than you'd expect a USC team to be. You know, and, and at times he seemed to have a blind spot between the numbers and a lot of I looked at all of his interceptions too over the last couple of years and A lot of them came in the middle of the field. But then I think back to someone like Matt Ryan coming out of B.C., who his last year at B.C. threw a lot of interceptions and and also at the time seemed to have a blind spot in the middle of the field, and he's kind of done okay. So, you know, this is where coaching and development, you know, he's still a young kid. I I think, isn't Donald 20? 20 years old. So, and that's a huge factor here is that's why coaching is so critical because here's a kid who is really a moldable piece of clay. I've heard great things about the kid. So, you know, that's, 
he he's a very good prospect. He has things that clearly need to be worked on. And I even said, you know, in my transition, I said that, um, where did I say it? Uh, I said that he's an exciting, tantalizing prospect, but not a can't miss. Because there's things that you don't know for sure that he can work through. But if he works through them, he could be a really good pro quarterback. So it'll be interesting to see the evaluations right. of John Dorsey and company there. So we talked about Allen. We've talked about Darnold. Let's talk about the guy that some people, actually I'd say a lot of people that I respect, think might be the top quarterback in this draft class and a name that when we ask people who could the Browns could be interested in, we hear Darnold and we hear Baker Mayfield. And Baker Mayfield is a guy that, you know, fiery competitor, clearly productive college quarterback. Yeah. When you watch Baker Mayfield, because you hear Johnny Manziel, when I watch him, there, I don't, there's nothing. There's, there's, there's no again, good. Let's put aside the personality stuff. I don't know the kids, okay? That comparison on tape doesn't hold water at all. Agreed. And, and here's what, what really did it for me. As I said, I watched the third downs and, and the 15-plus. I think he had maybe 125 15-plus yard plays. I would say that all of them except maybe six or seven were all within structure and timing. And that when I, that, when I came away from watching those, I was like, wow, this kid plays in the pocket. Now, his feet are frenetic, and I think that's just in his DNA. I think just that's the way he moves. Yeah, very you know, energetic. He's, he's a very, that's a good word. He's very energetic. I wouldn't call him chaotic. He just, his feet move a lot. But he doesn't leave. He just moves his feet. You know, it's almost like, I'm not comparing him to Peyton Manning, but I remember for years Peyton Manning, everybody said, oh, you know, he's very jumpy in the pocket. That was just his natural way. You know, I think that's just Baker Mayfield's natural way. But he's got a very compact delivery. He's got a good arm. I think people have gone overboard because there was a time people said he didn't have a good arm, so now everybody says he has a gun. He doesn't have a gun, but he's got a good arm. Yeah. He, I mean, he's he can, accurate down the field. And that's the, the other point that's so critical is he's an accurate thrower. And I remember having a conversation years and years ago with Troy Aikman, and he really delineated it so clearly. He said, you could do everything right as a quarterback, but if you can't throw it where you want to, you don't have anything. And, and Baker Mayfield is an accurate thrower, and he can throw seam balls. He has the, he's really good with those kind of firm touch throws, yep. you know, that seam balls like that. So I, was, I came away from watching his tape, and I kept watching more because I enjoyed watching him. He's fun to watch. I, I really like Baker Mayfield on tape. Would it shock you if he ended up being the number one overall pick? No, it wouldn't. Would you, when you look at those three that we've discussed, is he the guy that you have the most comfort with what you like out of a quarterback? <laughs> um, I would probably still have to say that Josh Rosen might be my personal favorite, and maybe that's just left over from the fact that I'm a little older, older guy, Nathan. So I go back to the era when you know it was the troop, you know, the Steve Bartkowski's in 1978. Okay. Yep. okay, but that's a personal thing. But um, but no, I would not be surprised. Look, if the Browns, and and again, I not. You and I don't know what the Browns are going to do. No. But if they love Baker Mayfield, what's the difference? If you say, well, well, we'll take him at four, well, what's, then why not take him at one? What's the difference? Of course. Don't let anybody dictate the quarterback decision Exa to you. Exactly. What's the difference at that point if you love Baker Mayfield? In your mind, have those three as prospects kind of separated themselves from Little the bit. Josh Allen? Yeah, because Josh Allen, and, and to me, the Josh Allen really points out the difference between arm strength and arm talent, mm -hmm. which to me are two different things. He has phenomenal arm strength, and he's big and can move. So he makes wow play. His, his top 25 plays, if, if you just put them on a reel, would be the best top 25 plays of any of these guys. You go, oh, my God. The problem is the arm talent. He's not a pace and touch thrower. A lot of the short and intermediate throws, his ball placement is not very good. You know, even on some completions, he can throw a shallow cross, which in the NFL is an easy throw, and he throws it on the back shoulder of the receiver. You know, he does those things too often. That's arm, arm talent is the ability to make all the different needed throws with precise ball placement and location. Arm strength is the ability to throw the ball hard. <laughs> yeah, right. And he can throw the ball hard. I mean, he's got a power arm. I mean, like I said, some of his big-time throws are big-time throws. Absolutely. Let me ask you this because we talked last year and obviously the Browns ended up drafting Deshaun Kaiser. Big, strong arm, maybe some issues with accuracy, ball placement, They're as you talked about. In some ways. I, I think when 
I feel as prospects they're similar. If they both yeah. maximize Allen their traits, they can. Allen is a little more spectacular in his in his splashy plays okay. than Deshaun was, just because Allen, you know, he's he's a little freakish, and that's going to cause some people problems uh, in in determining whether to draft him. I've heard he's scouting catnip. That was a, yeah, a phrase somebody yeah, used. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting phrase because you know it's it's a lot easier to justify drafting Josh Allen to, to an organization and saying, that guy's almost 6'5", he's 240, watch him move, watch him throw, look at the plays he makes, than Baker Mayfield. Because if they each fail, it's a lot easier to justify Josh Allen because he looks the part right. really well, okay? Yeah. And the kinds of plays he makes are spectacular. If Baker Mayfield were to be drafted high and he fails, it's easy to say, well, what you draft him for? He's short. He's doesn't have you know all the traits that you normally associate with NFL quarterback. Why, why did we draft this guy? <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. So, so that, I think I don't know if that factors into organizations. I don't know if teams think okay. Well, in some ways they should think about if we draft a guy, what would be the what's reason he like, fails? Let's say we like all these. We've done the pros and the cons. Okay. We've made the list of the traits: positive, negative, all those things that teams I imagine do. You also have to think, if this guy's not going to make it, why is he not going to make it? Yep. Okay? And I think it's a lot easier to look at Josh Allen and, and you know, and say that, well, he's got everything you kind of want. Whereas Johnny Manziel, uh, excuse me, uh, Baker Mayfield, Baker Mayfield, you you might say, well, he's, he's kind of short. Why did, we, why did we draft him? But you'd but, say, well, he was so accurate as yeah, ball placement. there. but I like Baker firing. Mayfield a lot. And then, you know, then there's other discussions about other quarterbacks Lamar Jackson's fascinating to me. I agree. Because look at what Bill O'Brien did with Deshaun Watson in, in for five games in, in Houston. And and I think Watson's a little more refined coming out than Jackson is. But I look I, I think to myself, with with all this shotgun, with all this misdirection, deception now in the NFL as part of the pass game, you know, the, the so called college pass game, but that's become part of the NFL sure. pass game. I, I think to myself, why can't Lamar Jackson run that kind of offense and be successful? I mean, you're not going to ask Lamar Jackson to be Carson Palmer. Right. You know, but, you know, why can't he run, you know, that kind of offense? And he's an incredible athlete and oh, he's strong arms can athlete. flick it out there, like, kind of like Michael athlete. Vick. When yeah, he throws and I think the ball. he's even more dynamic as a runner than Vick was. Which is a pretty strong yeah. statement. So, yeah. yeah, why would that guy not be a first round discussion? Exactly. You know, so again. Uh, it's all, by the way, it's always easy to say, and you know this, it's always easy to say with quarterbacks, well, they're not ready. But you and I both know any quarterback that gets taken in the top five is going to play as a rookie. So the, so the he's not ready discussion is pointless. The guy's going to play. Right, and we'll see what he now, ends up having. he may end up not being great, but he's going to play. Do you think when you talked about the offense that Deshaun Watson ran last year, applying that out to a guy like Lamar Jackson, do you think that that is something that can have sustained success in the NFL? Because you see the, kind of these new flavors come in, and typically within a year, the NFL figures a way to adjust to what somebody's done that maybe catches them a little off guard. That's a hard question to answer because I have to learn more about those offenses, and I'm being honest, because ultimately what it comes down to is the number of options you have in, in, in any given offense because obviously teams, defenses, you know, defensive coaches are pretty good in this league. Absolutely. You know, so, so you can be successful offensively in a lot of different ways. There, there are teams that don't do a lot of things and they're very successful because they execute what they do at a really high level. And, they, and they, there's enough window dressing that they cause just enough hesitation for the defense. But yet, I, I was having this conversation with Doug Peterson about the Eagles run game, which I think is really, really multiple. And Doug said something to me and it really made me think. And this is why I love the conversations here at the Combine. He said, well, we are and we aren't. And he said, really, we, we, we do a lot of different things in, in how it looks, but the plays end up being very similar, you know. And so there's ways to, to, to run the same play, and it just looks different at a different personnel, sure. different formation. So, you know, so when you say can it sustain, my immediate response to that is I don't see why not if the offensive coach has a great understanding that you want to make it look different, and then you just run a lot of the same stuff. Right. You know, so and I heard Sean McVay talking about how they wanted every play they had to have four basically plays that looked the same coming out of that play. Correct. So, yeah, right. it's interesting. Because don't forget, the, the players have to understand. You're not giving players 50 different concepts. They can't execute that. Right. 
You know, it's right. just like I, I try to tell people when it comes to play calling. You know, when it's third and long, let's say it's third and eight, the, the quarterback knows from the practice all week that he's going to get one of four plays. He's not going to get one of 50 plays that are going to be called. <laughs> right. He's going to get one of four plays that they worked on all week. Right. Now, can they run those four plays out of different formations? Yes, but conceptually with the route concept, it's going to be one of four things. You know, in the red zone, it's one of – it might be one of three things. You know, it's not It's not one of a hundred things. Limitless, right. right. Yeah. That's you, not the way it works. It's tailored to the opponent each and, and every week. Right. They know it's coming. And, and your players have to get it. Right. You know. And that's the challenge, certainly, to get it and then execute right, it exactly. on Sundays. And the other teams right. can try to figure out what you're trying to do. You know, I just go back to when I remember in 2000, I want to say 2012 it was, you know, they thought that Colin Kaepernick and RG3, that was the future of the NFL. And now both of those guys, for a variety of reasons, are out of the league, not Correct. even in the league. Correct. And, uh, you know, without getting into the specifics of each one of those guys, um, you know, I think that, look, at the end of the day, you're still going to get longer yardage situations in the NFL where the defense has the tactical advantage. Yep. And your quarterback is going to have to execute those. And that's why I made it a point to watch all third downs for a lot of these quarterbacks because I wanted to see – how? Because you, then you get a feel for how defenses want to play them. Like, for instance, Oklahoma was blitzed a ton on third down. That was one area Baker Mayfield definitely needs to improve. Now, and you saw that against Georgia. Right. Now, now they might have blitzed not just because it's Baker Mayfield. There could have been three different reasons why they blitzed. But Baker Mayfield throughout the 2017 season, one area he struggled was third down versus blitz. Now, he's going to have to be able to do that in the NFL. Yeah, that's part of the NFL. That's a part of the NFL. <laughs> You know, and, and again, as you know, Nathan, none of these guys come into the league finished products. So, you know, people who think, oh, he, he, this guy, is, he's going to come in and save us. It doesn't work that way. So as a part of the discussion that you think these people have on these prospects, as you talk, they're not finished, is of the things that we don't like about that prospect, what are the easiest to correct and what do that, we feel the most confidence and, that we can correct? And that's the way I look at this when I do it. A lot of times I'll make a note and then in parentheses I'll say can be coached because certain things can be and certain things can't be. Like you're not going to change Sam Darnold's delivery. That's not going to be coached. That's the way he throws a football. Okay, but can you teach Sam, Sam Darnold how to be quicker reading based on your route concepts and, and then teaching him defense. And, again, this doesn't happen in two weeks in training camp. This might not happen for three, four years. Right. There's a whole process. A lot of offensive coaches will talk about a four, a true four-year process for learning how to play NFL quarterback, which doesn't mean you can't have success before four years, but in terms of the way coaches see the position, that it's a four-year process. Most so, guys don't get four years. Um, if they have some success, they right. do, of course. Sure. Sure. Of course. I mean, I guarantee, look, we know Mitchell Trubisky is going to be the Bears quarterback this year. Glennon was released yesterday, and, and we know we knew it was Trubisky anyway. And he's got a long way to go, but he's going to be the quarterback. Yep. So, I mean, unless all of a sudden this year he comes out and throws five touchdowns and 30 interceptions, which is not going to happen. But, you know, unless he did something like that, he's going to be their quarterback. Yeah. You know, so, so if you draft a guy in the top five, he's going to get a chance. Absolutely. You know, but your point is a great one. There are some things that, you know, you can coach. I definitely think you can coach lower body mechanics. You know, I think Darnold, you, and I'm sure uh, Jordan Palmer is working with that. One thing you've talked about, and you mentioned it, even talked about Deshaun Kaiser last year, and I thought he got better with it as the year went on and got more comfortable, but it's not something. There are guys that either have that quick processing, quick eyes, right. and there are guys that have slow eyes. Quick eyes, slow eyes, how do these guys coming out this That's year? That's a big issue because that relates to the issue of field vision. And field vision is something that is, uh, there are different points of view. Again, smart people diff differ on this. There's a lot of quarterback coaches I've talked to over the years who feel that if a quarterback does not show good field vision in college, that he's really not going to do that in the NFL. That was one concern I had with Deshaun, as we discussed last yep. year coming out, that I thought at times his, his eyes were a little slow. Um, there are other coaches who think that you can help a quarterback develop quicker eyes by the nature of your route concepts against anticipated coverages. Right. You know, you the route concept, in a sense, defines the throw for the quarterback, so he's not necessarily reading per se. You know, the throw gets defined. Um, so, again, now you're getting back to where we started. It's coaching. It's philosophy. Yeah, when, when you watched these guys, was there anybody who stood out to you that had good quick eyes or anybody who stood out to you negatively for slow eyes from this year's class? 
Um, nobody stood out like where I thought, boy, they're really slow. You okay. know, I think that two guys, I thought there were times Darnold, like I said, in the middle of the field, I would love to have been in a situation as a coach where he came off the field and I could have, or, or in a, so a, what did a you meeting see the next day, you say, what did you see? I would love to know the answer to that. Because, you know. And that's part of what will happen in these 15-minute interviews and then correct. also in the, in when correct. they bring like in I was, on the visits. Like, because I don't do that. I don't work right. for a team. There were probably four or five throws from Darnold from this year, interception-type plays and, and a couple of others, where I would have jotted them down and I would want to talk to him about those plays and say, tell me what the route concept is, what's the play call, what did you see defensively, and then what did you see when you threw the ball? Because I'd like to know that. Yeah, Because absolutely. they look like bad plays. And, you know, so I'd like to know what he saw. Sure. I think Josh Allen at times, I don't, he's not a pure anticipation passer, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I, I meant to say that about him earlier. That concerns me a little bit. He's, he's a little more of a see-it, throw-it quarterback, and can he get away with that at times because he's got a hose? Yes, but I think on a certain level you have to develop some kind of anticipation. Is he ever going to be a high-level anticipation thrower? I'm not sure you can coach that, but he's going to have to be a little better. Yeah, but he's got the physical gifts a lot of those times with those guys with the cannon. No, they can wait, but it gets a little bit tougher in the windows of the NFL. This might be a bad comparison for a lot of people because they don't like the guy, but Jake Cutler was always kind of a see-it-throw-it quarterback, and he can often get away with it. Yep. You know, because he had a really good arm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I appreciate I could talk to you, obviously, for hours and hours. But we ought to let you get out of here. We've talked a lot about the quarterbacks, but just you don't even need to get into too much analysis. Who are some of your favorite non-quarterbacks in this draft, or, or oh. even one? Well, it's funny because, I, you know, to not talk about the guys who are obvious, okay, because, you know, we all know about the top guys. You know, there's a couple of guys. I just kind of made a list. I, I love Sony Michelle. I do, too. Love uh, Sony Michelle. I don't for know the where Browns. he's going to get drafted, but I love him. I think the Browns could get him maybe at 33 or come in even yeah. in the back, get yeah. a third first round yeah. pick, move back up yeah. in there. If you if you're the Browns, you come out of there with you know whoever the quarterback is that they like. Right. Four, you're going to get an impact player. Maybe it's Minka Fitzpatrick, Chubb. Right. Right. And then to, to land Michelle, I feel like I that's it. a home run. We're off and running. There's a linebacker, and again, you know, I have no idea how Greg Williams sees this, and I don't know, you know, what what they think of their linebacker position. Hopefully, they feel pretty good about yeah. it. Uh, but you just asked me about players. Sure. So yeah, I love. Myself. I love. Yeah. I love this Boise State linebacker, Leighton Vander Esch. I don't know if you know anything uh -huh. about him. Uh huh. He's six four, two forty. He's tall. He's rangy. For Browns fans, there were times watching him. He reminded me a little of a Carlos Dansby type uh -huh. player. You know, I, I love this kid. Uh, okay. I just really, I think he'll be a top forty pick. Uh, you know, I don't do the list like that, as you know, but I think that's where he'll end up going. Um, and I see tight end Hayden Hurst. I, I on really there. like that kid. I really like that kid. I think he's gonna be a very productive pass yeah, catcher. Yeah. Yeah. Now again, you don't need a tight end in Cleveland, obviously, with Njoku there. You know, who was late first round, right? He was or, late first round yeah, last yeah. year. Yeah. And he's a really talented guy. And I really like this uh, this Florida State D tackle, Derek Noddy. Some, really like some beef in the middle. Yeah, so, I mean, these are just guys, you know, I don't know where they're going to get drafted. I have no idea. You know, again, then it comes down to scheme, how they're used. Sure. You know, you know, you know, you've been doing this long enough. It's None of these guys, you study them and you look at their traits, obviously, but when you get to the NFL, nothing's in a vacuum. No, it certainly isn't. Of the quarterbacks this year, this is what I'll leave with because it's a question I asked somebody else. The last three years' worth of quarterbacks, does anybody in this class – get near the top for you like a Carson Wentz No, was. I think Carson Wentz, to me, coming out was uh, the last couple of years the best prospect. Um, is so there I, anybody golf level to you? I think Josh Rosen is similar to that. You okay. know, I think, I mean, I look at a Josh Rosen, the way he plays as being like a Matt Ryan, yep. you know, Jared Goff kind of player. Okay. You and know, Jared Goff certainly. I, and I, and I don't think Jared Goff is a super, super talent. I think he's a perfect example of a great system and, and the kind of quarterback he is works. It's a great marriage between McVay and, and Jared Goff, and he'll be a highly efficient NFL quarterback. But I don't know if he'll ever say, look, and if he wins a Super Bowl, then obviously people will say he's great, and, and deservedly so if, if that happens. But I think from a pure talent standpoint, he's a good quarterback. I'm not sure if he's, you know, elite, elite in terms of talent.